Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Eckstein Hall and Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers, people doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we're joined by a couple of observers of the uh, 2014 election process. Uh, let me introduce them to you. Uh, seated next to me is Christian Schneider. Uh, Christian is a columnist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He represents, I, I'd say, a conservative voice. Is that a fair assessment? Of, that is fair. Okay. Yes. That's great. Well, they know. <laughs> <laughs> they know. They read your work. That's a good sign. Uh, Christian uh, was a policy analyst for, in the Wisconsin legislature for a number of years. He was a senior fellow at the Wisconsin Policy Research Institute. He's also a contributor to the National Review. Seated next to Christian is John Nichols. John is associate editor uh, with the Cap Times newspaper in Madison. He's also the Washington correspondent for The Nation, and he is the author in his spare time of seven books, most of which deal with uh, the media and uh, our democracy and how we, uh, how we elect people today. So won't you please give them both a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. Good looking proud. Yeah. Did I say John's representing more of the Progressive viewpoint, okay? We've got conservative, we've got, John likes progressive better than liberal. I don't, you? Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not a liberal. Okay. No, I'll tell you that. Um, that might take up a half hour. So we want to have a little fun. I mean, elections can be long, uh, sort of um, difficult ordeals sometimes, uh, shall we say. And, uh, but we wanted to put uh, a couple of people together to, to talk about where we are uh, as we sit one week from election day. Uh, talk about the big issues in the race, what we might expect come election night. And so uh, I invited these two gentlemen to join us. And I wanted to begin by, by talking about the governor's race and talk about um, what we can expect uh, come election night. So, so let me begin, Christian, with, with a, a very broad question. Uh, what, what do you think are the keys uh, to this election, next Tuesday's election? Uh well, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for being here. It's great to see such a such a good good looking crowd here. Um, as <laughs> You've you got Marquette ties, don't you? I mean, your dad. Uh, my dad went to Marquette Law School. I believe he's he's probably home watching this uh, streaming right now. If he's not busy sending me uh, chain emails, which he normally does. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want to thank. I mean, you guys will probably all know John. He's uh, a walking encyclopedia of uh, of state government politics, whereas I am famous for once having eaten three bratwursts in a half hour. So uh, you just got to manage expectations. Uh, so, so yeah, I hear there's an election coming up uh, next week. And um, I wrote about this um, a, a few days ago. And if, if both the people are here who read that, then I apologize uh, for going over some of the same territory. Very walkish. <laughs> but uh, for me, I think it's, it's all going to come out to, to turnout. And it's not, I mean, you, you roll your eyes and say, well, of course, everybody says it, it comes down to turnout, whether you know, Democrats get their people out and Republicans. But I think it's overall turnout. I think it's how many people, whether this looks more like uh, a midterm election or a presidential election. We, we essentially have two electorates here in Wisconsin. We've got the presidential electorate, which usually hovers about 3 million people. It was 3 million in 2012. And uh, we've got the midterm uh, elections, um, which are much more conducive to Republicans. It's what gave us uh, Scott Walker and the Republican legislature in 2010. Um, then again, you know, in 2012, turned around, we had uh, a, a huge turnout, about 3 million. And you know, Tammy Baldwin wins, and, and Barack Obama won by, by seven points. Um, I think it's five of the last seven elections uh, Republicans have won the governorship here in Wisconsin. Uh, if Walker wins, I think it'd be, be six of eight. So you have those two electorates kind of fighting with one another. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, whether it looks more like a presidential year or, or more like a, a midterm year. The recall election that we had was kind of right in the middle. Right. I mean, it was almost a presidential-style election crammed into one state. Um, so just to throw out some numbers, I mean, you have the 3 million that show up for presidential years. Uh, I think the record is like 2.17 million mm -hmm. in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. And that was the, uh, the, big, the big GOP year. And then in uh, 2012, in the recall, you had about two and a, two and a half. So, um, you know, I, I know there are a lot of these polls out there that, and it looks like the race is very close. Um, one criticism that I've heard is that it looks like the, the race, um, 
these polls say that, you know, we're going to get 2.6, 2.7 million, which, you know, I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of intensity out there. And to those of us who would show up on a Tuesday afternoon to come hear, uh, you know, dopes like me <laughs> talk about this, it certainly seems like there's a lot of intensity. But, um, you know, just based on a poll taken by my eyeballs, I mean, I just don't feel like the, uh, the intensity, you don't have like a, a, a recall level intensity there. So mm -hmm. I don't know that you're going to see that level. I think if you're at about 2.2, 2.3 million, um, I think Walker has the edge there. John, let me ask you about turnout because I'll, I'll make the question even more precise. Can you not make an argument this election will be about Democratic turnout? Because Republicans in, in elections of this kind do turn out. All you got to do is look at Waukesha. Washington, Ozaki counties, they're going to the polls. Isn't this really about Democratic turnout? Well, first off, <laughs> let me, as long as we're starting with compliments rather than answers to questions. <laughs> and the compliment is an ingenious tool in politics because it allows you to think about your answer as you're saying something else. <laughs> Relatively sincere. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, <laughs> Christian Schneider is too conservative to win a Democratic primary and too reasonable to win a Republican primary. <laughs> uh, and as such, uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Burke calling it when she had to say something nice about Walker. She oh, no. It. Oh, he's a great politician. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> now the mudslinging has started. <laughs> no, no. I, I, say that, I say that because I, I think that Christian, while not a native of Wisconsin, um, is in fact uh, probably a, a very true embodiment of where Wisconsin Republicanism was and has been historically for a long time and where it may be again. Uh, at this point, we're in a, in a very sharp and bitter place in both parties. And uh, so I would, I'll counter Mike's, and by the way, Mike is the greatest thing ever and best thing on TV. <laughs> He's buying yeah, time right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to keep saying nice things about me, then I yield the remainder of my time. Marquette is a fine law school, one of, one of Wisconsin's two best. Um, and, and so, but in answer to Mike's question, no, I don't really think it is about Democratic turnout, okay. to be honest. I mean, the Democrats in Madison will turn out just great. And, uh, and they will, you know, roughly hold their own with the Waukesha and, and uh, Ozaki and Washington and, and somewhat Western Racine County ours. And you'll have, you know, you, you get your bases out pretty strong. Uh, the concern I have is that uh, the great mass of the old school kind of reasonable Wisconsinites may not turn out and may not be particularly enthused by this election because it has uh, tended to be uh, all about base, and there's been a tremendous amount of emphasis on base, uh, which I think is deeply troubling, and I think it's infected our politics, because politics is now an investment game. Huge amounts of money come in, and you are expected to win, not by a ma big majority, but 51. Your job is to win, not to, not to inspire, not to do big things. And I think we have two candidates who have risen to that standard. Um, and what troubles me is that this has not been a statewide election in, in the in, sense. In what sense, John? I, when I go out to rural Wisconsin, western Wisconsin in particular, I see a lot of evidence that uh, the gubernatorial election has at least touched those places but not come in strong. Uh, I, I personally am not a fan of surrogates always coming to Milwaukee and Madison, uh, or in Chris Christie's case, Hudson, so he can hit the Minneapolis media market. But, the, the bottom line is that we don't see this, the, the kind of traditional Wisconsin campaign where you really go out all over the state. And it, at least in the governor's race, I think most people probably know who the candidates are. As you go down ballot, um, we've seen the, the complete decay of political life and, and political culture in Wisconsin. It is diminished to a level that, that is, would be unimaginable to anybody that, that you know, walked the streets of this state even 25 years ago. And it's, it's changing radically. So I see this as a pivot election. And I think it's relevant who wins. No question about that. But I think it's important to understand that where we are at now is not where politics is going to be in this state. I think we are seeing the, the kind of pushing away of, of what I think was, frankly, a better politics and a movement toward something which is much more nationalized, much more money driven. Uh, and so I find it a deeply disappointing election. Uh, and a deeply unsettling one. 
this is a, a, a larger conversation. I'll pursue that in a moment. But, but let me just ask a couple of more questions about the governor's race. And, and I guess the, the first question is, it seems like the, the race is about jobs. It's about the performance of the economy. Is that, in, in the, your opinions, is that simply what this race is about? The rest of this stuff doesn't matter that much? Go ahead, Christian. Um, I think it was. I think at one point, uh, you know, the candidates were out there. Um, I think we're done with the uh, trying to convince people of things phase, and I think now we're just down to, as, as John said, the getting out the vote phase. I mean, there's a reason that the, that the president is, you know, just a few blocks north of here uh, in a district that he won with 99% of the vote. And if you're a believer in uh, vote fraud, about 106% of the vote. But oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he's there to try to drive up the vote in Milwaukee, as, as John said. I mean, the, the, uh, the first lady was in, uh, was in Madison trying to drive up the vote there. So I don't think we're in the phase anymore where they're out there, you know, trying to be reasonable and trying to, you know, trying to reason voters into voting uh, with them. I think they're now just in the phase of where we're going to get our people out, you know, get them outraged and, and get them out to the polls. John, is it about uh, jobs, the economy, or is it also about... Uh, Issues like uh, the expansion of the voucher program statewide, uh, about uh, uh, accepting money for Medicare uh, expansion. Is it, is it about that, too? Or, or do those issues not matter to people very much? Well, I think those matter, issues matter a lot. And I think, you know, like, <coughs> people are capable of putting a lot in their head at the same time. And, and that's an important thing to understand. When I talk to voters around Wisconsin, and I was in La Crosse last night. I'll be up in the Valley tomorrow night. And I, I never find folks who aren't aren't pretty up to speed on stuff. Uh, but they do reflect what the candidates talk about. And by any measure, the candidates have made this a race about jobs, and that's great. That, that is a, a old-school Wisconsin issue. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the unfortunate thing is that uh, there, there might be, well, there's been much talk about a state debt or a state deficit or anything like that, there might actually be a bit of a truth deficit in this campaign. And the, the, fact, is, the <laughs> fact of the matter is that we're not having a, a great big rip-roaring debate about jobs. We're having uh, two candidates um, who kind of are like trying to create an image of themselves as a person who will do something on jobs in the next term. Scott Walker says, you know, look, I shot high, I, I didn't achieve what I said I would. I haven't learned anything, but somehow I'll do better. And, you know, and I, wanna, I want you to know I'm going to have a hotline. When I'm in Iowa and New Hampshire, I'm going to be monitoring that job creation in Wisconsin on a daily basis. And Mary Burke says, Mary Burke says, you know, I, I was down at the family business, and, you know, I... I showed up and, and you know, I got, got, got my job the old-fashioned way. My dad was guarding the company. And, um, and so somehow we're supposed to sort this all out and get really excited about one of them. Now, I happen to think, and I'd be very blunt about it, I happen to think Burke has done a dramatically better job at talking about how to create jobs. Um, now, she's got a good uh, internet connection. She does, and, that's, and, and, <laughs> and that is the Wisconsin idea, by the way. The Wisconsin idea is to look around, find good ideas, and put them in place. And so, in, by any measure, uh, I, I wish that Scott Walker had an internet connection <laughs> and, and could find some jobs, but remember, he turned down the broadband money. And, you know, the, the challenge that I've got in this race, though, is that it is about jobs, but I don't think either of them have given people a lot to chew on. And so at the end of the day, we have reverted to a brutal level of negative campaigning. And the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, this is a state, I don't want to sound like, I promise this is my last nostalgic comment, <laughs> but this is a state where candidates used to drive together to debates. And when people knocked on doors in Wisconsin, they didn't knock on doors to check you off a voter list to see on the mobilization. They actually knocked on your door to talk to you about the issue and try and convince you of something. We're not seeing that happen this year. This year has been about how do I get my 51%, how do you get your 
And it's frankly been, in that regard, I think I find it highly disappointing. And again, I believe this is a pivot year. I think both sides are learning how to do a new kind of politics, much less journalism, much, less, much more money, uh, much more social media, much more instantaneous. Um, and I don't think either of them know how to do it very well. And I think that you know, maybe eight years from now, we'll actually have a real governor's race. No. Yeah, so you know, I think the race is, is tangentially about jobs, and it's about you know, all these other issues that, that should be big issues. But it's really about one thing and one thing only, and it's about Scott Walker. It's, I agree. It's about, I, I mean, Mary Burke, God bless her, she's essentially insert Democrat here. Um, she's a nice lady that had a lot of money. Um, we don't really know where she's been the last seven years. But uh, she, you know, she kind of fit the bill. It's all about Scott Walker. That's why all of Mary Burke's ads right now are about Scott Walker, and all of Scott Walker's ads are about Scott Walker. I mean, it's him talking to the camera about all the wonderful things that he's done, whereas all of Burke's ads are about, uh, about Walker, too. So, I mean, all this is is just a referendum on, on, on kind of Walker and how he's done. I was trying to think of a past election. I was, trying, I was thinking of, like, the 2004 election where you had Bush. Where you had Bush. And Bush was very much stay the course. You know, you don't change horses in midstream. Wait, is that right? That I think that was Reagan. Reagan. <laughs> I think that was Reagan. And be uh, careful of bears in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, and so so you have you Russian know, bears. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this big, uh, you know, traumatic thing that happens to the U.S. And then Bush says, "Well, we got to stay the course," much like we did in, in Wisconsin. Uh, and then. You know, you've got kind of this rich guy running against him that people, uh, you know, they're kind of 50-50 on, and he kind of seems like an elitist and, and all that stuff. So I think best case scenario for Walker, it becomes a referendum on him, and people are like, eh, well, he's at least better than, than who ran against him. And I would say that for Romney in 2012, too. I you, think that's, you, that's similar. You know, we, we hear a lot about uh, the influence of Barack Obama on the midterms, and, and these are Senate races around the country, congressional races. Uh, he is here on behalf of Mary Burke in North Division High School uh, later today. Uh, does uh, the president have any uh, impact on this election? I've seen commercials that try and tie him mm -hmm. to this race, but in your opinion, Christian, or yours, John, does he have any relevance to what's happening in Wisconsin? Let me pivot off Christian's comments there for a second and say, I think one of the most interesting things about 2014 is that Mary Burke did start the race as the candidate Christian describes. But she isn't finishing it as such. It's an intriguing thing. Um, I, I think Mary Burke under-biographied herself. And the fact of the matter is, as the campaign has evolved and as people have, have thought about her a little bit, you'll notice that her poll numbers have gone up. And so while... Christian says this is a race about Scott Walker, and, and certainly he is, he is the epic figure of this moment, the last three, four years in Wisconsin. The fact of the matter is that I think many candidates would have done far worse against Scott Walker, and I think that Mary Burke, as she has become known, two things have happened. One, I think she has become a better candidate. She's learning statewide politics on the fly. But two, as people have actually thought about her, her numbers have gone up, and they continue to remain quite high even with Scott Walker. And so I would suggest to you there's a little more going on there. And some of it has to do with something that Charlie Franklin brought out in his polls. He asked, the best question that Charlie asked this year, he says, what would you prefer, somebody who's been in business or somebody who's a career politician? And I mean, there you got it, right? That's the two of them, because Mary Burke is the not- The wording was a little different. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. You know, a sleazy career politician I don't think that was the versus word. a hustling no. business CEO. No, that was, you know, that was definitely not people, the word. No, I want to elect a priest. Uh, but, but, but no. I mean, this is when it, when you pose this question. The interesting thing that happened there is that people actually indicate, yeah, we would prefer the person who's done some business. And Mary Burke, despite the dismissals of her, and even myself saying she was in the family company and stuff like that. She actually has a rather diverse record and that is quite interesting, involving a lot of philanthropy, being on her local school board, uh, being a state cabinet appointee, being in business, starting a national trade group and things like that. It, it doesn't play badly at all. So here's the interesting thing. 
In a case where you have somebody that the people of Wisconsin say they desperately don't want, a career politician, versus a business person who you know, has actually got a pretty noble record of, of certainly being highly engaged in her community, she's done very well. So then the question is, what about, what about Barack Obama? How do we put Obama into this mix? Well, the interesting thing about Wisconsin is that Obama's, when we see, hear about Obama being exceptionally unpopular, oh my gosh, he's, he's like, you know, he's getting so low he can almost see Dick Cheney's numbers down there. <laughs> and, you know, it's, well, yeah, but that's, a na that's national polling. When Charlie goes in and asks about Obama in Wisconsin, Obama's numbers in Wisconsin are not particularly worse than Scott Walker's, right? You know, they're relatively... They're, they've been somewhat close, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. relatively... Although they're a little bit lower right now. They are a little lower now. I mean, this has not exactly been the greatest fall in history. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, I don't think that Barack Obama is going to play beyond the committed base on either side. Now, that's relevant because if it's a base election, there's, a, there's some factors there. But the truth of the matter is that Barack Obama coming here, he's coming to rally the base in, in Milwaukee. I actually, I, I'm, I'm deeply convinced that if they had sent him to La Crosse, it would have been just as good. If they'd sent him to Racine. And, you know, I, I think that one of the big mistakes, that, and I'm a big, big critic, I've got huge criticism of Barack Obama on a lot of issues. But I, I think one of the big mistakes Democrats have made this year is to presume that he is some sort of, you know, like kind of bottom of the polls, you know, stay away from this guy at all costs. And, and that's just not, it's reflected in a couple states in the South, it's not reflected in, in northern, especially upper Midwestern states that very enthusiastically voted for him in 2008, voted for him in 2012. And I would suggest would probably, and even if you look at Charlie's poll, he looks like he'd have a very good chance of winning if he was on the ballot this year here. Do you think, uh, and I asked Mary Burke this on, on Sunday, I said, do you, is there some risk uh, uh, to him appearing with you? Uh, what do you think? Is, is, he, is the president a factor in what's going to happen here on November 4th, or not so much? After that answer, I'm like the proverbial mosquito at a nudist colony. I just don't even know where to start. <laughs> uh, the, just, say, I, just say yes. <laughs> John, you're right. <laughs> no, um, I, I think... He could have, he, well, Mary Burke certainly hopes he has an effect, uh, you know, in, in as much as driving out the turnout uh, mm -hmm. downtown. It may have some kind of boomerang effect, you know, on the, the right-wing counties where they say, well, look, maybe they are tied together. But, I mean, you're just talking about a fraction of a fraction of a fraction at this point. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, you talk about Walker versus, uh, versus Obama and their popularity. I think they're exactly opposite sides of the same coin. I think in Walker you have a guy who's not particularly that popular personally. I mean, he, he just, I guess he doesn't exude warmth, let's say. Um, and people don't really think that he kind of really speaks for them or is looking out for them. But his policies, on the other hand, are actually fairly popular. I mean, you have uh, Act 10 doesn't really seem to be a big issue anymore. Mary Burke's not, not campaigning on that. Um, you've got photo ID, which, which is popular. You've got um, all this other stuff that, you know, one by one you go by the issues and, and people are, are fine with them. Obama's the ex exact opposite way, whereas he's very personally popular. People, you know, he feels my pain type of thing, but people just hate his policies. I mean, everything from Obamacare to, uh, you know, uh, his foreign policy, and even Ebola now, people are giving him bad marks on Ebola, which, you know. Well, not, maybe not as bad as Chris Christie. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Jailing nurses, I don't know. <laughs> so it's interesting that, you know, with Obama here, Walker, as I said, I think we're in the, the stage of the, the campaign where, uh, you know, you're not going to be changing your message or, or convincing people of a whole lot. But I think there are things that he could learn from Obama, kind of the whole, you know, I'm there for you. And I think that's, when you see, when you see his ads, I think that's what he's trying to convey right now. I'm talking, I guess, a bit about whether or not this election is being nationalized, which is sort mm -hmm. of what's happening around the country. But there are also issues, not just personalities, but issues. Uh, you know, the minimum wage, um, same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some of these issues out there that poll pretty well, at least we've seen that in the Marquette poll, 
do those make a difference in an election like this? Because there are pretty clear distinctions in this race between the two gubernatorial candidates on the issues I just mentioned. Yeah, I've been a little harsh on this year's election in a lot of ways, but one of the things that is actually appealing is that these candidates are very different, profoundly different on, on a, lot of, a lot of the issues you described. And, and so the question is not whether people have a choice. They do. Uh, our media does not communicate that well. Uh, our advertising campaigns uh, do not communicate that well. What our advertising campaigns, by and large, say is, you know, basically if you turn on your television, you watch all the ads, your impression is that a group of horrible people have invaded your state. <laughs> and you're being warned by different groups about individual ones. But the main thing to be sure is to stay away from the polls because you wouldn't want to put any of these people in a position of authority. And, and so we've got, had a lousy campaign, but the candidates themselves are very different. And the question, which is too late to ask now because it's, you know, we are in this final stage, is could you use some of these issues effectively? To my mind, the minimum wage issue is the best, by far the, the, the most useful issue of this year because you have such a distinction. Mary Burke supports a 10-10 minimum wage in Wisconsin. Scott Walker says that he's not even that into minimum wages. Maybe he dated one in high school, but you know, on balance, the minimum wage isn't somebody he wants to hang out with. And, and, and he says at 725, that's a living wage, right? And this is such an absurdity as regards people's lives that framed well, understood well, this could be a, a profound issue in Wisconsin, but not because of the minimum wage. That's not the key to it. The key to why it, it could be a big issue in Wisconsin is because it suggests such a radical disconnect with economic reality. The notion that somebody who can work 40 hours a week and live in poverty, like get up early, ride the bus to work before the sun is up, come home after the sun is down, and yet you still live in poverty. And to say, that's fine, that's just, that's how it works. And really, even though you look like a 35-year-old, I know you're a teenager. Uh, you know, that issue is, to my mind, the most profound issue out there. And if Scott Walker or Mary Burke, uh, you know, had had a real debate about it, if, if we'd really debated it, I, I think that uh, Walker would be in, in significantly more trouble now, politically, because I do think it illustrates just how out of touch he is. And, and I am somewhat surprised that the Burke campaign hasn't used two issues uh, more. One is the minimum wage in the context of broader economic issues. And the second, the second one is Scott Walker's presidential ambitions. Because polling shows that Wisconsinites absolutely don't think you can be governor and run for president. And yet, by any measure, Scott Walker has indicated a, a very passionate interest in running for president. So I think that... There are these issues, real things that people could talk about, but I'm not sure that they have fully integrated into the campaign. Uh, talk a little bit about the minimum wage, because I think that's some, Have you written about that? It seems like I, I recall you writing about that. Yeah, I've written about it a few times, and, uh, you know, the, the numbers are back in there somewhere. But, sure. Uh, you know... Is it a dangerous issue for Republicans in a place like Wisconsin in 2014? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's one of these national issues. It's one of these issues that's been nationalized. And, you know, it looks to be a big Republican year, at least in the, in the U.S. Senate. You know, it may tip Republican. Um, people are trying it everywhere. I disagree with you. I think uh, Mary Burke has tried it. Um, I haven't seen it. Maybe not as much as you'd like, but yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's one of these issues that... Ha that Support for it is a mile wide, but maybe just a couple inches deep. Um, certainly, uh, you know, there, there are labor groups and other groups out there that, that want it. Because the thing with the minimum wage is you can identify the people who will get a raise under the minimum wage. You know, they're the people that service our food and our friends and, and things like that. So you can say, yes, you are going to get a, a, a raise. But what you can't identify are the unseen people who are going to have their wages cut or who are going to have their hours cut or not be able to get health care because all these other businesses uh, have to, you're essentially making it more uh, expensive to hire workers in an already bad economy. So, um, and I know you've probably got numbers that, well, the state, uh, you know, they raise oh, the, the numbers for wage. The, well, just, say, just to make you, because I want to make your argument as strong as possible, Christian. Oh, thank you. I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> They studied the 14 states that raised the minimum wage since 2011, and their 
Unemployment went down at a faster level. Their employment went up at a faster level than the states that didn't. So throw that in, because that'll help you. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Well, of course, every state is their own ecosystem. But I mean, we just had. Uh, and why is the economy bad in Wisconsin? Why are we different than other states? Well, if you look over the years, at least for the last decade, for Jim Doyle and Scott Walker and everybody, I mean, we've always lagged in jobs. So it's not like this is all of a sudden. Uh, this is so we just aren't that great. It doesn't have anything to do with Scott Walker, mind you. Well, yes, Walker obviously hasn't unlocked the key to. Yeah, but it, but it's in not a lockbox with Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as if somehow he has. I mean, we, we did lose 133,000 jobs under Jim Doyle. So what, at the time when he made his promise, when Scott Walker was running in, in 2010, and he said, "I'm going to create 250,000 jobs," and then you, now you say some people say, "Well, it seemed like a real." It was never realistic. I mean, I was on TV and I was like, <laughs> "This this is crazy. This is like, you know, this is going to give them the the read my lips moment of the 2014 election where." He, did, he doesn't make his mark, and, and you know, it comes back to bite him, and it looks like that might be the case. Do you know why I love Mike Couchet? Why is that? Well, it's his good looks, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I should just leave. I mean, I just, just gotta... <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, didn't Mike Couchet, Mike Couchet bring up some interesting questions in the debate? or Not the debate, the debate that should have been, when Scott Walker and Mary Burke were with him, about that 130,000 job losses. Which I think is a very interesting thing. It's been such a big part of this campaign. And, you know, it's fascinating to me the power that Jim Doyle had. <laughs> he seemed kind of almost mild mannered. And yet, to, to take jobs away from Wisconsin, he ingeniously collapsed the global economy. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> your point, though, was, uh, and not that I need to make your point for you, but your, but your point was, though, that the performance preceding the Walker years, even preceding the global collapse, John, right. uh, was certainly not uh, top-notch. Yeah, I mean, for uh, there are all kinds of structural things, you know, the reliance on manufacturing and other things that, uh, you know, that Wisconsin has lagged in job creation. For, you know, you've seen the Scott Walker ads where he said, well, even during Mary Burke's years, we were 42nd in the nation or something in job creation, too. So, um, you know, this is, it's campaign season, so we blame this person or this person. But there's something structural in Wisconsin that, uh, uh, you know, you're right in pointing out that Scott Walker hasn't, you know, sprinkled jobs dust on the state and everything's come back. Not like the anti-jobs dust Jim jo <laughs> Doyle sprinkled, right? <laughs> no, I, yeah, look, that, that's just the... The, the, the reality of it is, I actually believe governors can do a lot to create jobs. I think that governors can play a huge role in creating jobs, and I think that we have seen it. In 2010, Minnesota elected Mark Dayton governor, and Wisconsin elected Scott Walker. They're really quite similar states. And, you know, the weird thing is, boy, that Mark Dayton, he, he implemented that, that brutal job-killing minimum wage increase. And... and you know, they also they pump money into public education. I mean, you can imagine, when I went to Minnesota recently, I thought I was just going to see decay. Every, you know, just a horror story. And apparently, they're faking the numbers because it looks like they're doing a lot better than Wisconsin. <laughs> well, uh, let's look. I mean, we can go back and talk about what Scott Walker did. He balanced the budget. Uh, with, there's that number out there, the $1.8 billion deficit, which I wrote about a week ago. I wasn't ago. even going to bring that up. That's, well, <laughs> it's because it's complete nonsense, and you're, right. honest, you're not I'm honest. I'm an honest man. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the state ends with you know, $517 million in the bank, which uh, under the Doyle years never occurred. There was never any rainy day fund, of it, or so to speak. Um, and, you know, so the state, at least fiscally, is back on track. The gap de deficit is almost in half. Um, so, you know, you can criticize. Scott Walker's done, but I mean, he's he's essentially got at least the state finances back on track. There you go. Let me ask you uh, each about the the attorney general's race. We did a debate here at at the law school not too long ago, and uh, one of the most amazing things about the, that race is how little is known about it. How little is known about the candidates and 
and, uh, and that people don't seem to have clearly formed opinions about it. You touched on this earlier, John, but I'll begin with Christian for this one. What's the explanation? Why don't people care about uh, a race that is actually very important in many respects? Yeah, well, the governor's race has just sucked all the air uh, is that it? out. Yeah, yeah out, of, out of the you know the, the AG's race. Um, I think it's going to come down to essentially a, a, a base election. Um, and I think it typically favors uh, Republicans. You remember back in 2006 when Van Hollen was running for the first time against uh, Kathleen Falk, and it was just a bloodbath for Republicans that year, and yet Van Hollen still ends up winning. Maybe that's because you know, voters didn't really like Falk all that much. Uh, but in those, these races where it's kind of a law and order type of thing, I think you see that with the, the, the state Supreme Court as well, um, those typically favor Republicans. Um, so I think this is going to come down to a base election that favors Schimmel uh, a little bit. Um, let me see if I get this right. If Schimmel, Schimmel could win and Walker could lose, but if Schimmel loses, loses Walker's going to lose for sure because I think he's, he's running ahead of Walker. Mm -hmm. I, think that's very, I think what Christian says is, is quite wise. I'll, I'll just add this one subtlety, though, about Wisconsin. Historically, we have loved to elect attorneys general who are not of the same party as our governor. It has delighted us. And we have done so again and again and again. Bronson LaFollette came in with Warren Knowles. Uh, and Jim Doyle was elected with Tommy Thompson. And J.B. Van Hollen was elected with uh, the guy who did the global economy. And, uh, and, and so the, the thing is, I do think, I, I hold out this hope that Wisconsinites do still you know, have a, do entertain a full ballot and look at it. But there is little question that uh, there's been media malpractice this year as regards the, attorneys gen the attorney general race. And that is that because it's not a big money race and because uh, the governor's race is, is gripping and we're, we're into it, uh, it has not been well covered. I mean, I, aside from the brilliant Mike Boucher and, and, and obviously Christian. But, you know, I have to tell you that you know, I'm, I know very little about Brad Happ, and, um, <laughs> and, and, and what I've heard from an awful lot of people is that, that uh, you know, they're waiting for the ads to start. And, you know, when the ads start, that'll define the race. And I'm thinking, what kind of nightmare world do we live in? You know, like, where, you know, it's like TV ads are going to tell us what to do. And, and if not TV ads, then our pattern of voting, right? We're just going to vote, you know, a straight ticket. But what's going to happen in the AG's race is a really ugly thing. You're going to have a, a level of turnout in the governor's race, and then you're going to have a lot less people voting. It's actually, you're going to have a, a collapse in voting as you go down ballot. But I that's think, the case all the time, isn't it? I mean, you it, have... Well, it wasn't before the Republicans got rid of straight ticket voting. Uh, but, you know, I actually, which I approved of, by the way. But the... Um, <laughs> But the, the thing of it is, is, no, I think it was better in the past. I, I will argue with you that, that the, we have become so governor-centric in our, in our media coverage. And I'm, I blame myself. I'm not, you know, I was part of the media. But I think we've become so governor-centric that we've neglected these races. And I'm going to say something that, boy, I, I almost, probably even Christian won't like. Um, one of the things that intrigues me is that I think some of the more intensive coverage of the AG's race has come from... Uh, Right, Wisconsin, and very, very, and, and if you listen to Charlie Sykes, they have talked a lot about this race. Conservative folks have talked a lot about it, and I'd be blunt with you. I think that's, you know, it, if, if Brad Schimmel were to win by some chance and Scott Walker didn't, which I don't think would happen, uh, I think it is because conservatives have really focused a lot of, you know, they focused, I think, a little more attention on the race than, than the broader media and other folks. Give me a, a quick uh, uh, snapshot of the uh, the race for control of both the uh, Assembly and the Senate in Madison. Uh, everybody I talk to seems to think this is going to remain in the hands of Republicans. Is there anything that the two of you have heard that would uh, uh, dispute that notion? Christian? Nope. Nope. They're both coming back Republican. Uh, Senate might even be I think the majority to, might grow a little bit in the Senate. Yeah, it might even go up to 1914 Republicans in the, in the Senate, and then the Assembly solidly Republicans. So um, I've written, I think, the, the, only really, the, real, the only real issue Mary Burke has to answer is, well, how are you going to work with the Republican legislature? So, so you can say, well, I'm going to raise the minimum wage. Well, 
<laughs> no, you're not, because it's not coming to your desk. You know, maybe she can do it by govern governmental fiat, gubernatorial fiat. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's all going to come down to how she works with the Republican legislature. Actually, a governor can do a lot, and uh, and one of the things the governor can really do is focus on job creation, which is an interesting notion for a new governor. But uh, but so I don't I don't I'm not in the camp that you always have to be in cooperation with your legislature. Some of the greatest moments in Wisconsin history have been legislators that really didn't like governors working with governors across lines. Um, but I do think that Christian's right that uh, in this year, again, because of this governor-centric phenomenon that we're in now, uh, there really hasn't been the kind of focus on the legislative races, except for a handful of them. And the interesting thing is that Republicans are doing quite well in some of these competitive races, not all of them. But in some of them, by running against the Republican Party. And when I watch Howard Markline's campaign down in southwestern Wisconsin, I, I see all those ads, and they're all like, well, you know, it's election time again, and we have a tradition of independence down here in southwest Wisconsin. It's intriguing. The ads are mostly paid for by out-of-state groups, which for some reason put a southern accent in southwestern Wisconsin. <laughs> but uh, assuming, I presume that it was the south. And... Uh, and but the weird thing is the ads all are like, Howard Markline, he's going to stand, he, he'll stand up to his own party. And so it is an odd phenomenon that we will not get a, a legislative result probably that is a reflection of where um, people are in the state. Part of that is the horrific gerrymandering of the state, uh, which is just, it's obscene at almost every level. Um, but another part of it is that... Um, we have, we have concentrated so much power in the governorship now that people really just, that money and so much of the energy flows up rather than to a, a full ballot race. Two, two quick questions, then we'll take some questions from the audience. Christian, uh, you worked on policy matters when you were in, in Madison. Give me a sense of, uh, let's say uh, Republicans are in charge at the Capitol. Let's say the governor is reelected. What are the policy initiatives? What, what do they want to do here in the next four years? Uh, well, I think he's already signaled that school choice is going to be a big thing. Wants to expand the voucher program. Expanding the voucher uh, program statewide. Um, you know, he's been a little evasive on, uh, on right to work. Um, you know, Mary Burke says, that, you know, we're behind all these other Midwest states uh, in job creation. Well, Michigan and Indiana are now right to work. So uh, maybe we should have right to work and maybe, maybe our jobs will come back. Um, you know, he's, he's been a little evasive on that. He's steered clear of it. I mean, it's not a, he said that's not one of his priorities. He's not is thinking it? about it. Um, but he hasn't said he wouldn't sign the bill, has he? There's nothing to keep a Republican yeah, legislator right. from drafting it up and, and making the arguments. So, um, so yeah, I think those are a couple of things. That and ta see. more tax. You know, he said on the program the other day, I, I assume that they're still looking for ways to knock down the, the tax uh, rates here in the state. Yeah, it was funny. When uh, Mary Burke was, was talking to uh, our editorial board, she said she opposed Jim Doyle raising the tax on the, uh, on the highest percentage of, of income earners in the state, which he did. Uh, and then Scott Walker came back and just nudged that back just a little bit. Uh, and so maybe Scott Walker should do what Mary Burke wants and get rid of it all together. John, I'm going to ask a question that's more related to some of the work you're doing for the nation. And, and you do follow national politics. A little bit. Um, Christian uh, mentioned earlier that it looks like it could be a pretty good year in the Senate for Republicans. Uh, how do you see it right now? And, and you know, uh, it does look like Democrats have their hands full. They do. And, and, and they certainly should because this is the perfect year for, for Republicans. Best, best possible scenario you could have in the, in the Senate races. It is a play out of 2008. 2008, uh, ancient history, but there was this guy named Barack Obama. He was incredibly popular, and he had coattails. And you saw a lot of people who are now vulnerable Democratic senators elected. Now they're facing the voters once more. So that, in combination with uh, re retirements of some key Democratic senators and uh, the continuing inflow of huge amounts of money into our politics, uh, makes this a, you know, a pretty a pretty good year for uh, the Republicans as regards the Senate, but it is a weird and, and wonderful year. I, 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 I have adored the, the odd phenomenon of this year that Kansas uh, might turn its Republican senator out, that Mitch McConnell 
on the verge of his life dream of, of being a you know, career government bureaucrat, uh, it is, you know, might actually get beat. I don't know that he will. And that the control of the Senate might be resting on runoff elections in Louisiana and Georgia. I mean, this is a crazy wild year. Uh, I think that the Republicans uh, have amazing advantages. Um, there is some evidence that the people desperately would like to do anything but, but give it to them, and so they'll even consider an independent candidate in Kansas. Uh, but when it is all said and done, I would be very, very surprised uh, if you don't end up with a very closely divided Senate, and it could well be a Republican Senate, um, or it could be a Senate, and I'll, I'll just leave one quick thing for people. Get to know the name Angus King, uh, the sen independent senator from Maine. Uh, Angus King has said he might, he caucuses with the Democrats now, but maybe he'd caucus with the Republicans. And he's counseled uh, Orman from Kansas to think about the same thing. And so let us not presume that on election day, everything is settled, because you might even have some shuffling around of senators and their party affiliations and their caucuses. Uh, and I rule nothing out this year because it's been such a wild ride. Anything you want to add to that? I tend to agree completely. I think it's going to come down just a couple of races. Could come down to Georgia and uh, Louisiana. Uh, Mitch McConnell's going to win. I think. I think he's fine. But I have more respect for Kentuckians. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's essentially up to Republicans. You know, if they get control of the Senate, I mean. Do you really want it? <laughs> I mean, because at that point, you know, there's a lot more on your plate. You take on, uh, you know, a lot more culp culpability for the issues that are out there. So, um, yeah, they'll probably have, uh, I think they'll have control of it, but the question is, do you really want it? Quiz question from Mike Couchet. At what point on election night does the national coverage switch from who's in control of the Senate to the 2016 presidential race? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you multiple choice, 815 or 820. <laughs> 815. Uh, let's take a few questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand. If you're in the seating bowl, uh, press down on the rim, not on the actual button. And I'll try and just get to a few of them. We'll start over here. And keep the questions brief if we could, please. Gerrymandering. Yeah. Somebody mentioned gerrymandering. My question is, Every 10 years, for the last 30 or 40 years, we have had uh, rejiggering of the uh, electoral districts by whatever party was in control. This year, Republicans, I have no doubt the Democrats would have done the same had they been in control. My question really is, this early into the next segment, why is it impossible or seemingly impossible for the parties to come together and enact something like the Iowa system of nonpartisan uh, redistricting and save this state. A lot of money and a lot of law firms uh, being cost uh, uh, business. I give you each a quick response to that. Well, he mentioned the uh, the 17th Senate district, and I think that's actually an example of why gerrymandering is is just fine. That was a district that Barack Obama won, but Dale Schultz also won, and a Republican's about to win. So that's actually evidence that there are some districts out there that are actually swing districts. Um, not a lot. <laughs> there aren't a lot. But so, I, you know, so you're going to doom you're going to doom the whole state of Wisconsin so people in Platteville can have a choice. <laughs> Look, I, mean, I yeah, love Platteville. In order in order to get the system that you and want, Blue River, you're essentially going to have to do a constitutional amendment telling people, saying people, well, we don't trust you to pick the legislator, leg, legislators to do this. We're going to hand it to you know a third party of unelected. Yes. Bureaucrats. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. I, yeah voters I, are never going to approve that. You're yes, they are. Voters, no. <laughs> they would vote. The voters. They, have you seen the approval ratings for politicians? You think a legislature? You think a legislature is going to pass? Oh, they uh, would. They wouldn't yeah. let the voters decide. But if the voters had the choice, I mean, the, vo the voters would put their their neighbor they don't really like in charge of it. Uh, you know, look, I think the question was right. Republicans and Democrats both do this. You remember back in 1982. Uh, there was a split legislature, and they passed a plan. Uh, what was their special election? And then they came back, and, and Democrats redid it all over again. Right, every, uh, look, there, and there weren't any calls at the time for, oh, we need a whole uh, There know, was. The Capitol Times, always. Yeah? Yeah, no, we've always called. We, we banged on the Democrats for it, and we banged on the Republicans because we're right. And, um, and 
the bottom line on this is that, that I hate to say that Christian's pretty correct about this. The, the politicians desperately uh, don't want to have a situation where they don't get to choose their voters. And um, the real guilty players in this are the courts. It is stunning to me that courts that have said we have one person, one vote in America, even if they haven't backed it up very well, would allow us to draw districts where you can permanently make one group of voters you know, irrelevant as regards the result in that district. And you, know, you draw overwhelmingly Republican, overwhelmingly Democratic districts. And the fact is, we have drawn most Wisconsin voters out of the political process. We have made most of our races for Congress and the legislature uncompetitive. And it is a terrible circumstance. And again, the courts are guilty on this one. They've been guilty since the 60s. They have not had the courage or, frankly, the, the wherewithal to step up and say, no, one person, one vote means that you actually have you know, at least a reasonable try at competitive elections. And, uh, and so it does fall to the people. And I think that uh, there are great groups right now, Common Cause and others, that have been desperately trying to get Democrats and Republicans to sign on for a nonpartisan uh, redistricting model. And, you know, you can either, you can either adopt the, the theory that we're never going to try and fix it, or you can get very passionate about this. Most of where our passion should be is on government reform and political reform. Let me, uh, I'm going to try and move around the room here and get to that. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I appreciate the levity. However, let's talk about what the United States should be doing with ISIS. Christian knows that. <laughs> Got there, right? uh, I came unprepared for the ISIS question. I, I got to admit. What do you think, John? Uh, I think this is our campaign, isn't it? This is the election year. No, but it's exactly right that you raised that question because that is what this gentleman who we, we put in here early today and got him in that exact seat so he could do it, um, has done is, is raise the reality of our political year, which is that we've got a, a significant election campaign run against Ebola, ISIS, all these other issues. I don't know what to do with ISIS, but I do know that, um, look, I can tell you this. There are, human, there are human issues on the ground there in northern Iraq and in Syria and in Turkey along those border regions that we cannot neglect. I don't think, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not convinced that the bombing initiatives work. I'm, I'm on my fourth president bombing Iraq now. And uh, so I have real doubts about it. Uh, and I, I have to believe that uh, a better job has to be done to build regional coalitions and to get the Europeans involved. This is my big problem right now. And I don't want to sound like too much of a Wisconsin isolationist. But I fear that, that too often um, the United States kind of steps in and tries to take a lead on things. And we do it so often that other players around the world uh, don't feel that they have to. And on this one, uh, I would suggest that, that this is a point where there has to be an immensely greater pressure, especially on the Europeans, to step up, in my view. Because if we're going to run this whole thing, uh, I think it's going to be a very frustrating, very long process in a region where the American people, I think, have signaled that they desperately would like to, to not be uh, the policemen. Let me, let me take another question. Let's go up here. Sure. Yeah, this side of it. System in Wisconsin. Uh, I, I want to find out how you feel about political judge, judges that are in Wisconsin, not only specifically about the current uh, or the previous uh, problems we had about voting rights, but also about how it affects people and their attitude about judges and the judicial system. Uh, so you're asking the question is about... Should we have elected the, judges? Yeah, should, should we have elected judges or, are, are, or should we be concerned about the way our judicial races sound and look? Is that part of your question? I, I think mainly, mainly because I don't think we should have judges that are as political as they are mm -hmm. and how they're affecting people. I, I hate to be in a situation that won't happen, I'm sure, where I was in a case where I was being judged based on my political feelings rather than the facts. Well, I think that's, you know, every time we get around to the Supreme Court races, we, we sort of have this discussion, right. you know. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. A lot of the judicial races that we have are n about nothing that the court actually does. It's all about, like I said, uh, you know, it's about crime and justice and all this kind of stuff that, that never really comes before the court. 
On the other hand, I mean, I, I think people tend to get that. I think people, I'm in favor of, of elected justices. Um, I think we can trust the people to decide who we want uh, determining what the laws mean. Um, and yes, that means they have to go out and raise money. And yes, that means you have groups uh, running ads on their behalf. But um, I just don't see any situation where the people are going to say, well, yeah, we can't, you can't trust us to pick who we want on the Supreme Court. And so let's uh, you know, hand it over to a, a gubernatorial commission on justices or whatever. Um, I just don't see, ever see it happening. John? I passionately support elected judiciary. I, I am strongly, deeply, profoundly in favor of letting people choose those who judge them. It is, a, it is a fundamental good. And anybody who wants a high priest judiciary, um, I, I think, is, is making a mistake. Let, let me follow up on that real quickly, John. At, at this law school, we did an event last year. Uh, a group of people put together, from the state bar, put together a proposal. Uh, they'd like the legislature to take it up mm -hmm. one term, one 15 or 16 year term, I think 16 years, yeah. one it's, term. It still takes the power away from the people. People can reelect a judge if they want. And look, the people should have control of this. This is a fundamentally flawed discussion. And, I, and it, it, it offends my small d democratic sense. The people run around saying, oh, well, we can't have our judiciary corrupted by money and politics. Like it's a good thing if our legislature is corrupted by money or our governor is corrupt, you know. And the fact of the matter is the crisis is money and politics. The crisis is not an elected judiciary. And, and if you, this is like trying to cure some major disease by, you know, looking at, at whether I've got a little skin pigment, you know, on my hand here or something like that. It's ridiculous. So getting rid of an elected judiciary and able to, able to make ourselves feel good about so-called justice is it's the wrong approach. The right approach is to get money out of politics. Yeah, I mean, you're never going to take... Po <laughs> yeah, you're never going to take uh, politics out of politics. And so even if you had you know, somebody making a determination, uh, picking justices, I mean, it's always going to be a political decision. One final quick question. Uh, let me go up to this young man back here. Yeah. Um, if, what, if the uh, Republicans are able to take back the Senate majority, do you think there will be a a change in the way they essentially have done business, or do you think we're going to set a record on vetoes in the next two years? That's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, the Senate right now is essentially a roadblock from all the House bills that they want to send to Obama. Yeah, I mean, they, they take vote after vote after vote, send them over to the Senate. The Senate just sits on them. Um, so, you know, if Republicans were to take over, a lot of those bills, it, it, it's funny. I mean, you'd think they'd all work together, but we have a Senate and Assembly in Wisconsin right now. When they're both the same party, you have a lot of inter-party fighting. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, we have all this power. Now, you know, we're smarter than you. Um, but a lot of those bills that are passing the House right now that don't never get to the president, um, they're, a lot of them are going to get to his desk. And, you know, you got to put the heat on them a little bit to, to make a decision whether to sign them or not. And plus, people are looking ahead to 2016. I mean, that's all part of the process. You want, oh, you yeah, want to be able to run on something. Look at all that we passed and wasn't acted on. Right. You can expect a few bills uh, that may show up in the 2016 uh, television ad at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to agree with what Christian says. Although, I'll, I'll, I would emphasize 2016 even more. I think that, I think, yeah, you're going to have a relative level of gridlock. Everybody's going to know it. There'll be a bit of showmanship. I, something tells me we'll hear from Rand Paul and Ted Cruz a bit. Um, and, but whether, whether Republicans are in control of the Senate or whether it's narrowly split, um, my sense is that I keep emphasizing this name of Angus King and perhaps Orman from Kansas, actually trying, maybe with Manchin from West Virginia, to form some sort of pivot caucus. And uh, that might be the most dangerous thing of all. Because if we give a handful of senators the power to say, oh, we can make this work. We can get beyond gridlock. And then their desire is to do a grand bargain, uh, where suddenly everything that Republicans wanted to do on Social Security gets done as part of a negotiation to prove that Washington can work. Well, in that situation, you know, I'm starting to feel a certain sympathy for gridlock. And, uh, and a huge interest in the 2016 campaign, when maybe if we're lucky, we'll be back here with Mike Couchet. Well, speaking of 2016, before you go, <laughs> do you think, if he's reelected, do you think the governor will run? What do you think about Paul Ryan? Uh, 
I think there is a lot more likelihood that Walker would run than, than, than Ryan. Ryan would run. I think Ryan's in the catbird seat in the house. I think he likes what he's doing. He just likes running the numbers. Um, and so I, I, I think the likelihood would be higher that Walker would run. John, final word. Somebody's got to tie Bobby Jindal in the, in the New Hampshire primary. <laughs> and so, you know, my sense is that Scott Walker will run. Uh, and, and I think that that's been his great desire for a long time. Every action he has taken has indicated a desire to do so. However, uh, we are in a weird situation because by any measure, to my mind, uh, from a national standpoint, Paul Ryan is a more attractive candidate. Uh, and so I think he will continue to feel pressure to run. And the amazing thing, the thing that fascinated me was that in Scott Walker's book, he mentioned Paul Ryan quite often. But when I read Paul Ryan's book, I just didn't find a lot of mention of Scott Walker. <laughs> and, and my sense is that that tells you a little bit about the real stature of the two men nationally. Paul Ryan is a national player, and he will be under pressure and, and discussions as regards a presidential race. Scott Walker will probably run, but he will be fighting his way in uh, with maybe a couple of Journalists telling him he's a good guy. Um, and so I think Wisconsin's going to be very much on the map. And, uh, but I, do, I, I will make this point that uh, Mary Burke has said, as the governor, she will not run. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I, I, actually, when I spent some time with Ryan, and I actually asked him that question specifically. Like, why didn't you mention Scott Walker? And he said, well... You know, the whole Act 10 thing, that, that's Scott's story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned before about that thing where, you know, Obama has a thing where it's, you know, people kind of feel, feel like he at least is looking out for them a little bit. I think that's something Paul Ryan has that, that Scott Walker uh, doesn't, which is why I think uh, in the... Uh, <laughs> chuckles. Uh, <laughs> Not everyone agrees. <laughs> Correct. Uh, but I think you see that in the polling, in the, like in the Marquette poll, where you see a lot more people are, are more open to the idea of Ryan running than Walker. So. I'm going to wrap things up there. Uh, before I say thank you to our guest today, uh, I just want to remind everybody that the uh, final Marquette University Law School poll of this election cycle will come out tomorrow. We still have a little bit of room, so if you're interested, you can join us at 1215 here at the law school. Having said that, I'd like to thank our guests, Christian Schneider of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and John Nichols of the Cap Times of the Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.